Welcome back to Medical Engineering, Medical Imaging Systems. So today we want to talk about a key concept of systems theory, and this is the so-called Fourier series and Fourier transform. You will see that this one will pop up in your entire study program. You will need Fourier transforms really frequently all the time. And it's a very, very nice tool to understand functions and calculating the functions. So really cool concepts, already 250 years old, but still very, very relevant for our field. So looking forward to be exploring with you the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. Let's have a look at the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. So let's start with the Fourier series. Now, what we want to introduce is essentially something like an equivalent thing to a vector space. And here we have the example of the vector space. So you see this little figure here. If we want to describe some arrow in 2D, then we can use a vector space in order to represent that arrow. And that arrow is essentially mapped onto bases. So here, our 2D vector basis is given by two vectors, that is E1 and E2. And if I know E1 and E2, I can express any other vector in that plane as a linear combination of the two. So I multiply E1 with some value, and I multiply E2 with some value and add them, and I get essentially one point in that 2D plane. So here, if you look at the green arrow, you see that I have to multiply the red arrow once and then add the blue arrow multiplied with minus two to it, such that I get exactly the green arrow. So the idea of the Fourier series is now to expand this concept to function spaces. So this is a kind of abstract concept, isn't it? But let's look into some example. So we want to have some kind of basis for signals. And now signals are functions, yeah? it's some f of t. So it's dependent on some time t. And we want to be able to express this function somehow with a kind of basis. And now the question is, is this possible at all? And the answer is yes, given some certain constraints. And the key idea now is that we want to express periodic signals. And all periodic signals can be expressed in terms of linear combinations. So you multiply with a certain weight, cosine and sine functions, and add them up. So the weighted sum can be finite or infinite, depending on the properties of the signal. But the combination of different sine waves of different frequencies or wavelengths is then able to approximate any kind of periodic signal. That is a pretty interesting observation, isn't it? Do you believe that? Well, I'll show it with a short example. So let's look at this function here. This function here is a sawtooth. And the sawtooth wave can be mathematically expressed as a linear increase within a certain period, and then it simply repeats. Now this sawtooth wave can be expressed as sine functions. Let's have a look at this. So this is now one sine wave, and you see it kind of approximates our sawtooth 
but it's not a great fit, right? So maybe one sign is not enough. So let's add another sign. And if we add a second sine wave, you see that our approximation kind of gets better, but it's still coarse. So let's add another one and 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 another one. And now you see that I kind of get better, but I still have to add quite a few of those sine waves in order to get there. Now this is the approximation with 20, 29, 70. So I need quite a few of those sine waves, but now I have sine waves of different wavelengths. I multiply them with a certain factor and add them up to approximate the red signal here and the blue signal was the one that I wanted to approximate and now the fit is already pretty good. So let's have a look at this in a little more detail. So this is what we're doing. We have our sawtooth wave and we want to approximate it with different sine waves. And what we're actually doing is we start with a simple sine wave that is simply the sine of t and then we essentially adjust the wavelength. So we take another sine wave that has now half of the wavelength. So this is two times t. And then we add three times t and four times t and five times t and six times t. Of course, we have to determine the correct coefficient for this. And you see here that we essentially have to divide by 3, by 2, and by 5 pi, and so on, in order to find the right coefficients. So we have different scaled sine waves, and they have a different wavelength. And increasing the wavelength, we have to compute new coefficients for the weighted sum. But if I have the right coefficients, I can start approximating this. And of course, I can go on and go on and go on and add more of these sine waves with increasing frequency and with even shorter wavelength. And you see that the approximation gets better. Now, this is essentially what we did to approximate the sawtooth wave here. Now you see here on the right hand side the waves and on the left hand side the approximation, so summed everything up. But let's have a look also at the coefficients that I need to multiply the waves with. And if I plot them here from zero to increasing frequency or decreasing wavelength, then you can see that I get the following pattern. So you see that I essentially get alternating points and these are the green ones for the sine waves. And I get in orange zeros everywhere for the cosine. So I'm only using sine waves here and I don't need a single cosine in the weighted sum in order to do the approximation. Now why is that? This is because f of t is point symmetric to the origin and this means that we only need sine functions for the approximation. So not a single cosine is needed here because our function that we desire to approximate, the sawtooth function, is point symmetric to the origin. Let's have a look at one more example and here we use a rectangular function over a certain period and here we have a different function and you see here that it is in the domain between 0 and 1. So we first start with 1 over 2. So this is essentially the zeroth frequency which is just the mean value. So we start with 1 over 2. This is the red approximation. So this is a, essentially a sine wave without any frequency. So this is just a flat graph. And then we start adding the cosines on top. And you see if I add the first cosine, then 
I actually need to determine a couple more coefficients and the next three coefficients, they're all zero. Then I have another cosine that is added here. And again, three coefficients that are zero and another cosine that is added here. And then slowly my approximation gets better. And you see, in order to improve this approximation, I have to add quite a few additional cosines in order to get a better approximation of our rectangular function here. So let's plot not just the cosines and the superposition of them. Let's also plot the coefficients over the frequency. And here you see that we have all of the sine coefficients now zero and only sometimes the cosine coefficients are non-zero values. And you see that they are also alternating here and we need quite a few of them in order to approximate our function. So here f of t is symmetric to the y-axis and this means that only cosine functions are needed for the approximation. So that's already an interesting observation and you'll see that actually if you have something that is symmetric to the y-axis you will only need cosines and if you have something that is point symmetric to the origin then you only need sine functions in order to approximate those periodic functions. Now, what is this Fourier series? So the Fourier series is actually a kind of function approximation where we are using cosines and sines. Now, we need a period duration of capital T, and this is the duration of one period. And then we can find the Fourier series defined as the function that we wish to approximate, f of t, is given as some coefficient a0 over 2 plus a weighted sum of cosine and sine functions. And here ak is associated with the cosine and bk is associated with the sine. Now, if you look into the bracket, you see 2 pi over t times k times t. Now 2 pi is essentially the length of your cosine or sine function and you divide it by the period length capital T in order to normalize for the respective period length. Now you have k times t. k is essentially giving the frequency of this wave and the higher you pick k, the more lobes you will actually produce in the sine and cosine and t is simply the index of the function. So here we have a superposition, a weighted sum of sine and cosine functions of different frequencies. And if I choose the AK and the BK correctly, they will produce the original function. So now the key question is, how can I determine the AK and the BK? These are called the Fourier coefficients. And they are essentially unique mathematical descriptors of the periodic function. One more remark, for even functions, the superposition of weighted cosine functions is sufficient. So here all the BKs will be zero and in odd functions, the superposition of weighted sine functions is sufficient and there all the AKs will be zero. So this is what we've seen in the previous example. Now a key question is how we can we actually compute those AK and BK. Now AK is determined as an integral from minus half the period length to plus half the period length. And then you have essentially a pointwise multiplication of the function with the respective cosine wave of that particular frequency. The same is true for the BKs. So for the BK of frequency K, you have to determine the integral from minus T over two to plus T over two. And then you have a pointwise multiplication of the function with the respective sine wave. 
I have a little animation here for you. So here you can see a function and we're essentially determining the multiplication at every point and then we add everything up. That is what our integral is doing. And once we do that, we get coefficients. So we are plotting them here on the right hand side and you can see that by multiplication step by step I get coefficients for different frequencies. And the nice thing here is for these periodic functions you can visualize this in this way here and you see that by multiplication and sum of every frequency I get a coefficient and I actually can then reproduce the original function from only the frequency coefficients by multiplying them with the respective frequency and adding them up again. So this is a process that is invertible. So you could say that our sine and cosine functions are nothing else than a projection onto a specific basis and this basis is then able to represent periodic function. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Let's have a look at the Fourier series here. So here we did all the calculations and we showed the results, but actually we would also like to determine our AK and BK for, let's say, our sawtooth function. So how would we do that? And here we can then remember that this is an odd function, so all the AKs will be zero, so we don't have to deal with them. So we only need to determine the sine wave coefficients. So these are our BK. Now we've seen that the BKs can be computed as the respective period length. We know the period length here is 2 pi. So we have to plug this in for our integral. So we integrate from minus pi to plus pi. And this is the function times the sine function of the respective frequencies. Now let's plug in our f of t equals to t. Then we can see that we can compute the actual coefficients as the integral from minus pi to plus pi of t times our frequency. And fortunately, this has a closed form solution that you find here on the bottom. And this is how we can then determine our coefficients also analytically. So it's not just that we have to determine this actually by having a computer evaluate this in a discrete way. This can also be determined completely analytically as in this example. Now, what we still have here are the sines and cosines that pop up and this notation is actually not used that much in literature. What people very often do is they switch to Euler notation. And you may remember that you can represent using complex numbers a sum of cosine phi plus i sine phi as e to the power i times phi. So this is the Euler representation of complex numbers. And this is very, very convenient because then we don't have to deal with the ak and the bk. So we can plug this here in with the definition of the cosine and the sine depending on the respective Euler representation. So this is what we did here in the center row. And this actually allows us to find a representation that is then no longer using AK and BK, so the two values. Instead, we are using a complex number. Complex number also has two coefficients. This is CK. And you can see now that we represent the sum of the sine and the cosine as the Euler function here. But this is an equivalent notation as we've seen earlier, but we don't need the sine and the cosine, but it's just the E that is put in here. And of course, you then need the I in order to make sure that this is a complex number. Still, we can determine the CK as the integration from now zero to T 
of the original function pointwise multiplied by the complex frequency here. So the projection onto the complex coefficients can still be done with this kind of projection. So it's an integration and a multiplication. Okay, so this is maybe a bit of math, but this way we can write things up in a very compact way. And if you look into the course book that you find also in the video description, you will see that we actually also pieced out how to get from the AK and BK to the CK in the course book. There's a geek box if you're interested in the math. So I definitely recommend to have a look at the book. And this is already the summary of our Fourier series. So we can approximate functions using sine and cosine waves. And we can then completely describe the function using the coefficients that are associated with the respective frequencies of sine and cosine waves. We have some special cases for odd and even functions. In the one we only need sine and in the other one we only need cosine functions. And the Fourier series might have finite or infinite terms, but all of this is only applicable to periodic functions. So Fourier series requires periodic functions. And this theory, already 250 years old, still very, very useful. Now this periodic thing bugs us a little bit. So this is why we want to switch over to the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform addresses this question here. How can we extend the Fourier series to non-periodic signals? So the answer is, well, we extend the period simply from t to infinity. And then it can be non-periodic because one period length is just infinitely long and in an infinitely long period you can represent every signal. So why not just do that? Well one thing that is associated with, with a big period t is that the number of terms needed for the approximation increases and this means that the distance of successive k decreases. Yeah, so you have now really a long period length and the longer I take the period length, the smaller is the distance between the different k's in terms of frequency. Now if I go with the period length to infinity, then k becomes a continuous variable because the distance between the individual steps of k goes towards zero and then k becomes continuous. So now ck becomes a function of k and the summation needs to be an integral. So you've seen that if we had previously with the Fourier series a sum of a discrete ck's, then we now need to convert this into an integral. And the ck which had a discrete index for every k is now converted into a function c of k which is now a continuous variable. So that's the major change. You see it looks very similar other than we switch from discrete to continuous and this allows us now to have infinitely small distances between the frequencies. So we can have this at an infinite fine resolution. If we do so, now we are able to analyze also signals of arbitrary length t. Mm -hmm.
Now, what we get then here is the Fourier transform. Now, the Fourier transform is computing a weight function CK, and this is the Fourier transform of f of t. And in the following, we won't use the CK anymore, but we will denote this by capital F of Xi. And now Xi is the continuous frequency variable and F is the Fourier transform. So now we get for a continuous frequency variable values and they're still computed as the integral, but now from minus infinity to plus infinity because of the infinite period length of f of t times and now our sine and cosine they are wrapped up in this Euler notation and this is then e to the power of minus 2 pi and here we need xi for the frequency variable and t for the spatial domain variable and we integrate over dt and this delivers the Fourier transform of t and you see here that our Fourier transform is again a kind of system that we can apply. So the Fourier transform of a function represents the amplitude of each frequency. It converts a time function into a frequency domain function. So now we have two continuous variables, the frequency variable xi and the time variable t. If you are talking about images, then the time variable is a spatial domain variable. So this is why people sometimes say this is a spatial domain and a Fourier domain. So this is often then associated with images. If you're talking about functions that are time dependent, then it's the time domain. So sometimes people use that interchangeably. I also do. So let's have an example and let's start off with a very simple example and we won't go into too much mathematical details here, but let's have a cosine wave with a frequency of five Hertz at a hundred samples per second. Then the magnitude, so this is the, the cosine wave on the left hand side. And now we have the conversion into Fourier domain. So the magnitude response here on the right hand side. And you see that the Fourier transform is nothing else than exactly two peaks. And these two peaks are located at exactly plus minus five hertz. So this is the Fourier representation of the left signal. And if I know the Fourier's representation, then I can determine the other signal as well. So I can, I can use them interchangeably. If I know the Fourier transform, I can compute the original function and time domain. And if I know the time domain, I can compute the Fourier domain from that. So I can convert from one domain to another. And this is essentially a base transform onto just a different set of base vectors. But now our base vectors are a continuous frequency variable. Why is this useful? Well, let's look at a little more complex function. And here we actually have two sine waves and they have a frequency of 50 Hertz and 120 Hertz and a thousand samples per second. But we added this zero mean random noise on top. And now if you look at the left hand side, if you see just a 50 Hertz wave and a 120 Hertz wave, you would just want to see like two sine waves overlapping, right? It doesn't look like the left hand side here. So this is kind of difficult to see the two sine waves here because all of the noise. But now if I go to frequency domain, you can see that I can very clearly see the two peaks at 50 Hertz and at 120 Hertz. Note that I'm only showing 
the positive side now of the frequency space obviously there would also be a negative one but i'm only showing the positive half space here but you see the two peaks very distinctly and you also see that the zero mean random noise loads into all of the frequencies and looking at this we actually have a very nice means now of getting rid of the noise right so i could reconstruct the signal essentially perfectly if i put up a threshold on the frequency here and i just preserve the two peaks then i could reconstruct the original signal and this is exactly where the fourier transform and also other things that we learn about in this class will be used for us so we can recover the original signal by using tricks from signal processing and in particular the Fourier transform is super useful for applications like denoising and so on. But it's also a super useful tool to understand the systems, what they're actually doing and to work with the different systems of different properties. Really, really useful tool and just a hint that it will be useful for denoising. Okay, so let's summarize this a little bit. We have just seen that there is this concept of the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. And I hope you could follow that the both concepts stem from the idea that I want to find a basis, a kind of vector space like representation, like we do in a 2D space where we have these base vectors and linear combinations of the base vectors are able to describe any point in that plane. We can also use sine and cosine functions to describe any periodic function as a weighted sum. Now, if we want to get rid of the problem that they need to be periodic, we have to extend the period duration towards infinity. Then we get rid of the problem of being able to model only periodic functions. This comes essentially at the cost that we are no longer having sums of sines and cosines, but our previous k is converted into a continuous variable that we then denoted as xi. And this is a continuous frequency variable that we can then use in order to describe this base vector representation. So it's essentially a conversion into a different space. And in this space, we can represent any kind of function as a superposition of sine and cosine waves. Very, very important concept. And you will see that the Fourier transform regarding signals and systems will come up all the time. And it's a super useful tool that you should understand at some point, maybe not after this video, but you will see it comes up in your studies again and again. And it's very relevant for analyzing functions and to describe signals and systems. In the next video, we will introduce another very important concept that is called convolution. This is also linked to systems theory. And we will see that this is also linked to the Fourier transform in just the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this little video and it brought to you some understanding of the Fourier transform, Fourier series, why we need those concepts. It was a bit mathy, I must admit that, but I hope that the examples help you with understanding this concept of expressing functions by sine and cosine functions. So if you liked it, please continue watching and we will see again in the next video where we talk about convolution. So thank you very much for watching and bye bye.